Good evening, ladies, all of you watching out in television land. Um, Sarah's still um, not doing worship, so we're just going to pray and go right into the Bible study. Um, I'm glad to be back. I hope my voice doesn't go crazy today <laughs> from because I haven't didn't hardly talk for two weeks. So let's pray. Lord, I just come before you, and I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy and your compassion and your forgiveness. And I just want to pray, Lord, for the ladies that aren't here tonight, Lord, for whatever reason, that you would be with them. I pray that if they are sick, you would heal them. If they're overwhelmed, you would give them strength and courage. If they are um, just tired and busy, that you would give them rest. And I pray that you would just bless them where they are, Lord, that they would be able to, um, if not now live sometime in the near future, they would be able to just sit down and, and watch the study and listen and just spend that time with you, Lord. And I pray for Pastor Mike that you bless him tonight, that you would fill him with your spirit, that you would give him everything that he has need of right now, Lord, that you would watch over him. I pray, Father, that you would watch over the technology tonight, that it wouldn't go wonky. And Lord, we just want to pray for our country. And God, we know that there are so many things that um, have to happen just because of your word. And yet, Lord, we are having to watch them. And I pray you would give us strength and courage in the midst of that. I pray for your will to be done with the elections, Lord, that the wickedness would be exposed and righteousness would prevail. And Lord, we know that you're coming back. We know that this is not our home, and we look forward to the time when we can sit at your feet and look into your face, and this world will be but a vapor. We thank you for the hope and the promise and the assurance of heaven, and God, we thank you that you are were willing to die on that cross in order to give us that eternal life. And Father, I just want to ask for myself, lastly, that you would empty me of myself and fill me with your spirit. I pray that you would override my body and my brain and any distractions that might be there, that you would speak through me, Lord, that you would um, help me to share everything you want me to share. And I pray that you would just touch all the ladies that are watching and listening, that you would touch them by the power of your Holy Spirit and you would minister to them. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. And thank you for the opportunity to teach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Open up your Bibles, ladies, to 1 Kings chapter 15. That smudge. We've been, <clears throat> excuse me, in Chronicles the last couple of times and um, looking at the, the southern kingdom, most of all, we, we looked at uh, Rehoboam and then um, his son, um, Jammy, however you say his name, and um, then um, Asa, who we've been looking at the last couple of weeks, we've been, been going through the study. And um, so as we're back in 1 Kings 15, um, we're going to do something a little unconventional and twitchy for me, but here we go. Um, because we've been dealing with the southern kingdom for so long, I want to just bring you up to speed on the northern kingdom before we move into the fullness of our study today. So in 1 Kings chapter 15, let's drop down to cha uh, verse 25. So Asa becomes the king down in the south over Judah and Benjamin, verse 25 of 1 Kings 15. And Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and he reigned for two years. Uh, 26. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the sins with which he had made Israel to sin. So that's all the idolatry and the, you know, the fake priest and the high places and all of the different, um, I, uh, you know, types of different worship that he allowed and set up. So he just continued in all of that. Verse 27, and Basha, the son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar, conspired against him. And Basha smote him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, 
for Nadab and all of Israel had laid siege to Gibbethon. Gibbethon actually belonged to the children of Israel. We know that from Joshua 19 when they were dividing out the land. It's part of the territory of Benjamin. But if you remember all the way back under David's rule, the Philistines were a constant thorn in David's flesh and they were constantly um, making incursions into the nation of Israel and taking cities captive. Now David got many of them back but there were some that he did not get back, and Gibbethon is one of them. So it actually belongs to Israel and belongs to the tribe of Benjamin, but the Philistines have occupied it now for some number of years. So apparently Nadab had gone there to lay siege to it to try to take it back. So Basha conspires against him in verse 28. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Basha killed him and reigned in his stead. Nice, right? We're actually going to see that a lot, especially in the northern kingdom where there's a lot of, um, you know, slaying of the current king and then someone comes in and takes over. And sometimes literally it's only days that they reign before someone comes in and kills them. So we'll see that a lot should the Lord tarry in the northern kingdom. So here's the first, the first time of that happening. So Basha, he goes in and kills Nadab, Jeroboam's son, verse 29. And it came to pass when he reigned that he smote all the house of Jeroboam. He left not to Jeroboam any who breathed until he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord, which he had spoke by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. And that, when we looked at that um, quite a number of weeks ago, back in chapter 14, remember Jeroboam's son was sick, and um, he sent his wife in disguise to go to the prophet to find out if the kid was going to die or not. And when she goes there, the Lord had told him, look, at Jeroboam's wife is coming. Here's what you need to say. And in um, 1 Kings 14.10, this is what he had told her. I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam all of the, every male <coughs> in, in, um, sorry, every male of the house of Jeroboam and all that are shut up and left in Israel, I will take away the remnant of the house as a man takes away dung until it is all gone. So we see here, Basha is the fulfillment of that prophecy that had been prophesied um, to Jeroboam those years earlier. And now he kills all of Jeroboam's lineage and family. Verse 30 of uh, chapter 15 because of the sins of Jeroboam which he sinned and which he made Israel to sin by his provocation with which he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. Now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, for they are written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. And there was war between Asa and Basha, the king of Israel, all their days. And in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Basha began to reign over Israel and he reigned for 24 years in Tirzah, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin with which he made Israel to sin. So while we were dealing with Jer Rehoboam and then Asa down in the south, as Asa took over, this is what was happening up in the north. Jeroboam died. His son took over. He reigned for two years. As he's moving into his third, this Basha guy, he, he conspires, he goes and he kills him and then he reigns. But we see here that he just continued in the same sin. He didn't, he didn't change anything. He just got to be the big guy in charge and still um, kept them in the same condition in the north that they were in, starting with Re uh, Jeroboam. So now if you'll go back to 1516, I told you it was a little unconventional. So now Basha is there. If you remember that as we looked at <coughs> Asa, in Second Chronicles, he had gone to war with the Ethiopians. God had given him the victory. Then in chapter 15 of Second Chronicles, the prophet comes to him and tells him, look, it, you know, if you stay with the Lord, he'll be with you. If you forsake him, he'll forsake you. And remember, he, there was the big revival, and he offered all the sacrifices and all of that. So he does all of that, okay? Now, about 15 years later, is verse 16 of chapter 15 of 1 Kings. 
And there was war between Asa and Basha, the king of Israel, all their days. So again, this is 15 years after 2 Chronicles chapter 15. So I know. See, at least you guys, I get to tell you it, and you can just write it down. I'm the one who gets to figure it all out. That's exciting. Some of them are easy, some of them not so much. Verse 17, and Basha, the king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah that he might not allow any to go out or come into Asa, the king of Judah. If you remember, when we were in 2 Chronicles um, 15, it tells us that when he was warring against the Ethiopians, that some of the people from um, Ephraim and, um, wow, I just brain blipped. Hold on, because now I got I to check. Manasseh, yeah, I thought it was Manasseh. Some of the guys from Ephraim and some of the people from Manasseh defected out, kind of out of the north and joined the south because they saw, the scripture tells us, that God was with Asa. And so remember, there was people that basically left under the, from being under the rule of, of Jeroboam and, and Basha to go be under the rule of Asa because he, they saw that the Lord was with them. So Basha is like, yeah, we're not going to let that happen anymore. You guys don't get to defect. There's no, there's no immigration plan here. So he goes to Ramah, which is part of the territory of Benjamin, and he starts to build it up and fortify it so that nobody can cross from Ramah down into the rest of Benjamin and Judah. So he's trying, basically, he's building a border wall. That's what he's doing. He's building a border wall. So Ramah, again, it's in the territory of Benjamin. Um, we find that out, again, back in, in Joshua when all the land is being distributed to, to everybody. It's near um, Jerusalem and about five kilometers or so from, from, from Ephraim. So it's, it's up there more a little towards the northern territory, but it's still technically part of Benjamin. Rama, actually, there's, it's mentioned quite a bit in Scripture. A couple of the really prominent ones are, um, <clears throat> the, it was the home of Samuel the prophet. So that's where, that's where he dwelt. Um, in Jeremiah 31, um, the people of the nation of Israel are, most of them have already been taken captive, and there's a, the second part of them that are being taken into Babylon. And Jeremiah says, you know, there's weeping and lamenting in Ramah for Rachel's children uh, were, and they are no more. And then we see in Jeremiah chapter 41 that Jeremiah the prophet was actually imprisoned in Ramah for quite a while. So there's a lot of stuff that's gone on in there in, in Ramah biblically. But here, what's going on is Basha is trying to build a border wall so nobody defects. Then it says in verse um, 18 and 19, <clears throat> excuse me, Asa took all the silver and the gold that was left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabron, the son of Herzion, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, and said, Let there be a league between me and you, and between, as there was between my father and your father. Behold, I have sent presents to you of silver and gold. Come and break your league with Basha, the king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So, first of all, if you remember, about 35 years earlier, um, in chapter 14, um, verse 25 and 26, Shishak, the king of Egypt, had come and invaded um, the south and had taken most of the gold and silver out of the house of the Lord away from Rehoboam when Rehoboam was the king there. So he, Asa now goes and basically just gets the remnant of whatever was left, whatever Shishak didn't get his hands on or whatever might have been collected maybe from the... Um, the victory over the Ethiopians, because we know in Second Chronicles there was a lot of booty that they got to take. Whatever, whatever was left there, he now takes it and sends it to Damascus, to Ben-Hadad, to bribe him, to make a league with him so that he can, will leave off of helping the north and come and help him instead. Sorry, drinking pause. <clears throat> So he has this amazing Ethiopian victory with when they were ridiculously outnumbered, both by man and chariot. 
but he has this massive victory. Why? Because he sought the Lord, right? Now, 15 years later, it's not even the equivalent. I mean, the Ethiopians were, were you know, outnumbered. They had the chariots and this whole deal. This is just Basha trying to build up Rama. Or Rama. I mean, it, like, it's not even that big a deal. But instead of going to the Lord, instead of depending on the Lord, he goes and cleans out the treasury of the house of the Lord to go bribe this guy. He doesn't turn to the Lord. He turns to the world to try to get help from the world. The prophet Azariah in 2 Chronicles 15 had told him, look it, if you, if you stay with the Lord and you follow after him, he will be with you and he will bless you. But if you forsake him, he's going to forsake you. And, and when all that happened, he just had this victory. Azariah comes and lays out this great prophecy. Remember, Asa's response was like he was floored. I mean, he just basically falls on his face and says, okay, and we're going to follow the Lord. They offer this massive sacrifice. All the people come together. You know, the, the, the prophecy is told to them. They're praising the Lord. They're, they're full of joy. They do this great offering, and they all swear we will not worship idols. You know, we will follow after the Lord. And here, 15 years later, where, what happened? Where, where is all of that? Because he told him, don't forsake the Lord because he's going to forsake you. Now, he forgets all of that. He robs the house of the Lord. Then he goes and offers a bribe to the world. So he's going to the world, to a pagan king, to get help instead of the Lord. And so as I was studying this, <laughs> this is something I, I don't do very often, but we're doing it tonight because that's what Jesus said. The Lord... Um, I turn to Psalm chapter 1. And we're going to look at the first three verses of Psalm chapter 1 tonight because Asa has this great victory. He has this great prophecy that comes to him, and he responds in such a way that it's very clear that his heart has been changed and moved. The people respond in such a way that it's very clear that their heart has been changed and moved. He does everything right and needful and necessary and sets his face and the direction of the people that he has charge of right directly towards the Lord, and he does it in a beautiful way with the sacrifices and the offerings and, and with the, the commitment that they all make. But here we are 15 years later, which in reality isn't very long, and, and we don't see anywhere that he seeks the Lord. And, and when, if the Lord tarries and we move further into this story, it gets worse. It gets worse than him just robbing the house of God and going to, to, to Ben-Hadad. It gets far worse. So we're going to look at that a little bit tonight because... Right now, where, where we are as believers in this time and in this space, not just in this nation and in this state, but just in the time and space we are in the line of history. And right now, what's happening is the, the lines are constantly being drawn in the sand by the Lord. And the challenges that we are facing now as believers and that we will face coming down the road until the Lord comes are going to be challenges that we have never faced as believers in this country before. And we are going to have to understand that our allegiance is not to the United States of America. Our allegiance is to Jesus. We are going to have to understand that there's a point where we have to surrender trying to fight to what, hold on to whatever we think is our rights here in this country and say, Jesus, let your will be done. Just help me to follow you. Because we do not want to become like what happened in Germany and have the Christian church, because they were so 
willing to fight or, or not fight for the Lord, but to say they wanted to have their rights, how whatever they would be given to them, they capitulated to a man who destroyed six million Jews. We do not want to get so caught up in trying to fight for our rights in our nation that we lose sight that this isn't our home and we end up walking away from the Lord. We don't want to get so discouraged because of all the things that are happening or so frustrated over all the things that are happening or so mad over all the things that are happening that we walk away from the Lord. And we certainly don't want to allow the tidal wave of horribleness that keeps coming at us every day to so overwhelm us that we lose sight of Jesus and we, we lose sight of who he is and what he's called us to do and we lose sight of our inheritance and the treasures that we have in him. And, and, I'm, and if you haven't experienced on any level battling for that yet, I'm here to tell you that you will. If you haven't experienced on any level battling between what's happening in front of you and trying to reconcile it in your mind versus following the Lord and feeling discouraged and feeling overwhelmed or feeling sickened or feeling frustrated, you will. And, and we have to allow the Lord to gird us up, but we also have to be determined to be girded. And somewhere along the line, Asa lost that. So as we look at Psalm 1, <clears throat> verse 1 says, I'll just, I'll just read verse 1 and then we'll break it down. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Walks not <clears throat> in the counsel of the ungodly. Um, that word counsel is advice or plans of the ungodly. The ungodly is a morally wrong person, a wicked person, or just an unrighteous person. And I think you and I can just put after that equals unsaved. <laughs> so, so we're not to walk in the counsel or the advice or the plans of the unsaved people. Our job is to walk in the counsel and the vice and the plans of the Bible that we hold in our laps and that we read every day. As believers, we're not to seek advice or counsel for, for our lives or our problems or our issues from unsaved people, but also not from people who claim to be believers, but walk in unrighteousness, who walk in a way that's contrary to the word of God. It doesn't matter what you claim, it matters how you live. And you can say you're a Christian six ways from Sunday, but if you're a person who practices drunkenness, I'm sorry, the Bible says drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God, and you should not be seeking counsel from that person. If you're a person, the person who claims to be a believer, yet you're living in fornication, I'm sorry, the Bible says fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't seek counsel from that person. We need to be wise and discerning as believers. Not, Jesus himself said, not everybody who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. He will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. The scripture is very clear that we have to be able to look at the fruit. And if the fruit stinks, it's rotten. I don't care what the tree has written on it. It can say apple tree all it wants, but if the fruit on it is rotten, who cares? Why, why do you want to eat rotten fruit? Just because it says it's an apple? If it's gross and maggoty, who cares? <laughs> so we need to be wise and understanding and discerning in that. Then it says, nor stands in the way of sinners. Stands is to abide or to remain. The scripture tells us in John chapter 15 that we're ab to abide in Jesus. We're to remain in him. It's the idea of stationing yourself and planting yourself there. Don't station yourself and plant yourself in the midst of unrighteous people. We live in the world. We work in the world. If you work out in the world, you work with unrighteous, unsaved people every day, unless you work at some Christian place. 
I get to work with Christian people because <laughs> I work at the church. <laughs> But you're not to park yourself in the middle of their life and to live in their life. You're not to, 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 to stand in that place and abide in that place. It says, nor stand in the way of sinners. It's a, it's a life that, <clears throat> like a trodden road. Like, don't put yourself on the, the, the worn path of that, the sinners. Don't, don't step out and put your journey on that path. Your journey is supposed to be on the path of righteousness, the highway of holiness, as, as Isaiah tells us, not in this trodden, beat-down path of the way of sinners. If you're saved, your life should be different than it was before, and you should be on a different road. As believers, we're not to live our lives the way non-believers do. Duh, like I said, <laughs> it should be different, Right? We don't, we don't behave, we don't make our decisions, we don't line ourselves, we don't think, we don't see, we don't watch, we don't speak, we don't act as non-believers. Now, we're all a work in progress, and we all have stuff that God's got to, you know, still get rid of from our old life. I was just telling, I don't know why this popped in my head. I was just telling Pastor Mike, um, back when I wasn't saved, my sister and I, if you read my book, you know the story, went to Hollywood to go get tattooed. Well, in the tattoo parlor, there was this dude, and he was, like, uber cool and uber handsome. And so he's, you know, giving me the googly eyes behind his sunglasses at midnight. And um, so, you know, I'm talking with him and, you know, whatever. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I got a band, and I play the harmonica, and I sing, and I am a sucker for the harmonica, okay? I am a sucker for that. And I'm like, oh, really? He's like, yeah, we're playing this gig in Long Beach. You know, you should come check it out. I'm like, okay, cool. So it was at this, this club in Long Beach that I knew. And so my sister and I go, well, when you walk in the, the, the middle door, there's actually two separate clubs within the same club. So they have live acts on each side, right? So we walk in. Now, okay, I'm not saved. Me and my sister were these little blonde girls with our black mini skirts and high heels. And we're done up, you know, because whatever. And we tell them we're here to see so-and-so, and they go, oh, they're in that room over there. So we go in that room over there, and we're over there, and we're sitting there for like a half an hour, and we're like, this is the lamest show ever, and this is not like the dude that I met. Like, what is up with this? Like, okay, maybe this is like the worst opening act in history, but whatever. So we wait a little while, and I finally we're like, this is not right. So we go out, and I ask somebody else. And they're like, oh, yeah, they're in that one over there. I open the door. <laughs> because I'm always going to go in front of my little sister. I open the door. Have you ever seen like in a TV show where somebody opens the door and literally every head in the place turns and looks? Uh, that's exactly what happened. Me and my sister are these two little blonde-headed white girls, and it's an entire room full of cholos. <laughs> and they all turn and look. <laughs> And they're rough-looking characters, man. Well, because I was me and not saved, I'm like, Psh, you're not intimidating me to shut the door and turn around. I'm going in. So I went in. <laughs> and every head was like. <laughs> and so we found a corner, watched the rest of the show, made it out alive. We were good. The, the only reason I tell you that story is this. Because if I did that now, I wouldn't walk in the door. <laughs> I wouldn't go to the place in the first place. And if I did go there, I wouldn't have walked in the door. As soon as I opened it and saw that, I would have been like, yeah, we're going away now and shut the door. Why? Because Jesus changed me. Because then I was not scared of anything and many things that I should have been scared of because it was just my deal. Now I'm wise enough to go, you know, sometimes you just shouldn't be stupid. It's not bravery, it's stupid. You see, I was walking in this path on this journey, and Jesus saved me, and now I'm on a different road. Don't, don't walk in the way of sinners. That is not what we're called to do. Then it says, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. To sit, obviously, is to remain. You have sat down and you've made yourself comfortable. 
You know, when we used to do the drug and alcohol um, thing here, uh, one of the, the things that I used to say as an illustration, because temptation comes to everyone. There's no one is excluded from that. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or not saved. There's temptation in the world, and that's just part of the fall. But here's the difference. When you have Jesus, when temptation comes and knocks at the door, you open the door, and you have a choice. You either slam it shut and say, Jesus, take care of that, or you invite them in for dinner, sit down, and have a conversation. You see, you invite them in for dinner and you sit down and have a conversation, they are seated. Now you have chosen to entertain and to accept that temptation. Now you have chosen to grab a hold of it and bring it into your life, and now the next thing is going to be that you're going to act upon it. You see, when, you, when something's seated and sitting down, you're intending on remaining there. You don't usually walk into a room and sit down if you're going to leave in the next 30 seconds. You go to someone's house and you have no intention of staying. You walk in the door and they say, oh, have a seat. You go, oh, no, I'm just going to stay for a second. You don't sit down because what happens if you sit down? You're not leaving in 30 seconds. <laughs> That's why if you come to my house, I don't ask you to sit down. <laughs> I'm just kidding because <laughs> I want you to leave in 30 seconds. I'm totally kidding. Some of you are like, no, I've been to your house, actually. You didn't ask me to sit down. <laughs> you know what? I'm just rude. That's what it is. It has nothing to do with that. I just don't think I'm like, oh, people, if they want to sit down, they'll just come and sit down. Like, I don't know. I'm just weird. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> so you sit down. You're comfortable, right? You're, it's to abide or to be a part of the assembly or the inhabited place. The scornful literally is... <clears throat> A frivolous and impu impudent person who scoffingly despises the most sacred precepts of religion, piety, and morals. Now, if you don't recognize that we live in a world full of scoffers, you have not been paying attention. Because <laughs> we live in a world full of scoffers. We, and we shouldn't be hanging out and sitting down and being comfortable with people who mock and ridicule what we believe and what the Bible says. Because you know what? It rubs off. You may not think it rubs off, but it does. It brings in little niggly, naggly little seeds of doubt that start to fester in your mind. And maybe it doesn't take root for a week. Maybe it doesn't take root for a month. Maybe it even takes a year or more, but it's there. When you sit down in the seat with scoffers and you hang out with them, that is going to get on you. It's part of humanity. And we live in a world of that. People who mock and scoff and ridicule our beliefs. The most scoffed at one, obviously, is the rapture of the church. This, and as probably equal with that is creation. They're the two most scoffed at things when it comes to our belief system. The world has scoffed and mocked at creation for decades. And now, even sadly, within the church, there's mockers and scoffers that are, uh, are that way concerning the rapture of the church. Peter told us that in the last days there would be mockers and scoffers saying, where is his coming? For since the world began, everything remains as it was. How about Tim Tebow? You know, when he was playing football, especially, and not so much when he was playing baseball, but when he was playing football, the world mocked and scoffed him for being a virgin and for not wanting to have sex until he got married. This dude who went to college, who was this handsome, you know, quarterback, you know, super popular, and the media mocked him for being a virgin and wanting to, to have um, his first time be with his wife. The world mocks and scoffs, and we are not to be in the seat of the scornful because it does wear off. And I'm telling you, ladies, the times that we live in, it's more important now than ever to stand on the truth of what God's word says and to remind yourself that it is true because the darkness is descended, and it is not going to get lighter anytime soon. 
I have been attacked in my mind in ways that I have never been attacked before in my Christianity. When I got saved, there wasn't a person on this planet that could tell me that God's word was not true. From the moment I got saved, not a person. I never doubted it. I never questioned it. Not once. Even the most outrageous things I read in the Bible as a young believer that I didn't even understand. But you know what? In the last six months, you know what has been the attack in my brain? The Bible's not true. I'm reading it, and it's like, well, that's a ridiculous story. Oh, and I got to stop, and I got to pray, because I know I believe it. I know it's true, but the enemy is attacking it. And we need to realize that, that mockers and scoffers are abundant, and we need to not be spending our time with them. Verse 2, so we are not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We are not to stand in the way of the sinner. We are not to sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, his pleasure is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he does meditate day and night. Our delight and our pleasure should be in the law of the Lord. That word literally is Torah. For you and I, it would be the whole Bible, right? We should delight in God's word. Let me just say this to you. Delighting in God's word is not about feeling warm and fuzzy and like you want to go read your Bible. Okay? Delighting in God's word is recognizing that it's true. It's recognizing that it's nourishment for your soul. It's recognizing that you need it. And it's recognizing that it is the thing that gives you sustaining ability in the world that we live in. It's taking pleasure in God's word and how he's given it to us and that we have it. It's not a feeling. Sometimes you get feelings. Sometimes, I'm sure all of you, if I talk to each one of you, there's been times in your life where you're just like, oh my gosh, if I could just sit down in a, in a room and no one bug me, I'd just read my Bible all day because I just can't get enough of it. But there's also times where you look at me and go, oh my gosh, I don't even want to read my Bible. Like it's just black ink on white paper and I'm so tired and I don't want to do it and it's, I don't have time and I'm so busy and to sit down and I'm my kids and uh. So it's not a feeling. But it's that recognition and, and, you know, just being thankful for it. You know, I mean, I just got done reading um, <clears throat> a Voice of the Martyrs um, book called Hearts on Fire, which if any of you want to borrow it, I'd be happy to lend it to you. Um, I, don't, I think they wrote it a couple years ago. They might have done a, just recently done an updated version of it or something. But anyways, it's um, eight women of faith. Um, from various times in in more recent history um, from different countries and the things that they've gone through in their walk with the Lord, all from persecuted countries, all from places where things are very terrible. And, um, you know, they all, like, they would die to have their hands on a Bible. You know, there was one of them that she... um, she started basically being an evangelist and at like 15 years old and she was in, I want to say China, but I can't swear because it's all mixed up in my head. And she, um, she needed, she was going to go out and she wanted to tell people about the Lord and she had memorized portions of the Bible from someone else's Bible that she had been able to look at, but she didn't have a Bible of her own. And she was just like, man, if I'm going to go share God's word with people, I should at least have a Bible of my own so I can, you know, absorb as much of it and memorize it and then, you know, I have it, and I can learn more. Well, <clears throat> she couldn't find a Bible anywhere. Like, every place she looked, that you know, she would hear, oh, yeah, there's so-and-so got some smuggled in from somewhere. Go see this person. No, we don't have them. Or, you know, they never made it, or they're all gone, or whatever. And um, finally, she got to this one person who um, someone had tried to smuggle in several hundred Bibles. They got caught. Um, the Bibles got washed up on the shore, and this person grabbed as many as they could and literally dried each page by hand, um, you know, peeled them apart and dried each page by hand to try to preserve them. 
and, um, and she actually wouldn't give the girl a Bible until like this whole series of events happened to basically prove that this girl was really a Christian and really wanted this Bible because they were so scarce and so precious. And, you know, if you think that's a person, she, she was willing to take each page and dry it and not give one away until she knew that it was what was supposed to happen. That's, that is taking pleasure in the, in the word of God, you see. That's valuing the word of God. Then it says <clears throat> to meditate day and night. That's, that meditate is like to ponder or to murmur or to speak to oneself in a low voice. Now, I know none of you ever do that. <laughs> I know none of you ever walk around murmuring and talking to yourself. <laughs> but I do it all the time. <laughs> so this is kind of what I, I was thinking about when I was thinking about this part of this verse. You know, there's times when, um, especially if I'm trying to figure something out, that I have to like talk myself through it. And so I'll just talk to myself out loud, okay, so if I do this, then this will happen. But then what about that? And then if I do that, then that should make that work. And so I'll like talk under a very low tone, but I'm talking to myself, and I talk out the problem to solve it. That's the same idea, to, to meditate on God's word day and night, to talk, to sort of talk it out to ourselves all, all the time. You know, to, to be in that space where as you're moving through your day and, and you're, you're musing about this or this problem or your kids or your job or whatever, that it's like, okay, but wait a second, but what does God's word say about that? So I know God's word says this, and how does that apply to that? You see what I'm saying? Day and night, that's the idea of where you're murmuring and talking and talking things out, but with the Bible every day as much as you can. Now, I realize that. You know, um, sometimes you can't do that because people will think you're insane. Um, I get that. But, but that's the idea that, that the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate, that that's, that needs to be that part of our life in that way, where as we're working through things, that what we're doing is we're speaking God's word, and we're, we're focusing on it as much as possible day and night. And, you know, sometimes that's hard, and I, I know, you know. I mean, I have to work really hard to get God's word into my life as much as possible every day. It doesn't just happen magically. You know, <clears throat> first of all, I have stuff to do. Second of all, I have a husband. Um, thirdly, sometimes I literally just can't take any more input. Like, I've just had my input limit, and I have to just have silence. <laughs> Or I can have some stupid 30-minute funny something on that I don't have to think about. So I have to work really hard at being in the Word, listening to, you know, Bible teaching, listening to the audio Bible, listening to Seeds Family Worship, so that I have God's Word going into me as much as possible. Because the more that I have going in, the more that I'm able to meditate on it on a regular and consistent basis, and the more I'm able to think about it and filter my life through it. This is what we are to do as believers. We are to delight in the word of God and to meditate on it day and night. Why? Because we are prone to forgetfulness, we are prone to wander. We are prone to choose sin over Jesus. We are prone to lean on our own understanding, and we are prone to go in the opposite direction that Jesus would want us to go. That's just life. And we all have the same crooked bent. And so God tells us this is what we're supposed to do to keep that from happening. Asa, <clears throat> as we said, he has this great victory that God gives him over the Ethiopians. The, the prophet comes to him and says, look, man, God wants to bless you, but you just got to stick with him. And 15 years go by, and somewhere in that 15 years, Asa forgot the lessons that he learned. Somewhere in that 15 years, Asa forgot 
to meditate on the God's word day and night. Deuteronomy 17, you know, Moses, when he was tell, giving that to the children of Israel, he said, look it, when you put a king over you, he's not to multiply horses, he's not to multiply wives, he's not to multiply gold and silver, he's not to go to Egypt or to send you back to Egypt to go get horses, and he is to take and write himself a copy of the law and study it day and night. Asa forgot that to Moses. He left that part out of the equation. So now this little situation with Basha comes up and Rama, and instead of going to the Lord like he did with the Ethiopians, he decides to handle it his own way. Not that big a deal, right? It's just Rama. It's just Basha. Not a big deal. I'll just get Ben-Hadad to come on my side, and then we'll be cool. Because remember, the north did outnumber the south. They, they had, you know, ten tribes. The south only had two. And Benjamin was the smallest of all the tribes. So they were, yeah, they were outnumbered technically, but it wasn't like it was a war. He was just building up an a, a, a immigration prevention wall. But it's almost like what happened with Joshua in, in Joshua when they did the whole AI thing. Some of the guys go up and they're like, man, there's only a few thousand of those guys. We don't need everybody. Just send a little bit of us. We'll go. We'll take care of them. It's no big deal. Joshua's like, all right, cool. We'll just send part of the army and go. They got obliterated because they never talked to God about it. Well, Asa doesn't talk to the Lord about this whole situation with Rama and with Basha. Because somewhere along the line, he left off the first principles of being the king. And the first principles of being the king is God and his word. And, and, and so he goes and goes to the world. And that is exactly what Jesus does not want us to do. That's why he wants us to do, verse 2 tells us in Psalm 1. And if we do it, look at verse 3. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in season, and his leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. I love this verse. First of all, they shall be like a tree. If we put our knees on the ground and our nose in the book, we will be firmly planted and rooted in Jesus, and we will not be easily uprooted or moved we will be able to stand no matter what storms come our way. We will, we will not be moved by every wind of doctrine that comes or every trial that comes or every hardship in the world. We will be firmly planted like this tree planted. That word planted, it, it communicates the idea that someone took a, a, a seed or a sapling and purposely put it where it was to grow. You see, if we stay in the word and we stay in prayer, God will put us where we are supposed to be, where we can be planted, and where we will grow. He will purposely put us there. When we do the right things and avoid the wrong thing, you know, when we're in the word, we're obeying the word, we're walking in and after righteousness, not, you know, doing the walking, sitting, standing of verse 1. The Lord takes us and plants us in, in a solid place in the spiritual realm where, where we're not easily moved by the things of the world and the trials that come our way, but he also plants us in places where he wants to use us, where we can grow. Where, our, where, where we can bear fruit. It says here, by rivers of water. A tree being planted by a river of water means that they will, it will never be dry. It will never, therefore, it will never be brittle. It will never wither because it's always going to have a source of water and it's always going to have the nutrition it needs because it's planted by that river. If we do it, what what God calls us to do in verse 2, we will be planted by that river and we will have that river in us and through us. Jesus said that, that we would have rivers of living water flowing through us. That's for us to be 
nourished and strengthened and refreshed as much as it is to be poured out on other people so other people can be nourished and strengthened and refreshed. Because this tree that's planted there, it's not just there so it can be there. It does other stuff, right? It provides homes for bugs and insects and birds and whatever. It provides shade. It provides protection. So then he says, that brings forth fruit in his season. I really want you to pay attention to this and hear what I'm about to say. It is not always fruit season. There is not a fruit that I can think of that is in season every single day of the year, 365 days a year. They all have seasons where they come and they go. In its season, and it's not always fruit season. Sometimes it's pruning season. John chapter 15, every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. Those that do bear fruit, he prunes it that it would bear more fruit. Pruning season stinks because it hurts. But, you know, pruning season is necessary. You know, every time I read that verse in John chapter 15, I have flashes of things that go through my mind because it says that which does not bear fruit will be taken away. And I think about relationships. As a believer, I think about relationships that I treasured and I loved that have been taken away. And I think not bear, that wouldn't, wasn't bearing fruit. I think about maybe something that I tried or a way that I thought or uh, a, a particular bend that I had that the Lord has pruned and taken off because it wasn't bearing fruit. And I'm really grateful for that. I'm grateful for the things that have been taken out of my life because they were not bearing fruit. Because here's what happens. It doesn't matter what kind of plant it is or tree or shrub or vine or whatever, if it bears fruit and you don't prune it, the fruit will get worse and worse and worse every year because the branches that are on it that are not fruit producing or that maybe they're sick or something like that, they draw the life and the nutrients away from the branches that are supposed to bear fruit and can bear fruit. So you prune them off so the nutrients can go to the places that are fruit bearing. And then he says in John 15 that, that he prunes those that do bear fruit so they can bear more fruit. And I think about things in my life that, that the Lord has allowed me to do that, you know, that he's seemed to be blessing and whatever, and then he made adjustments in it. And it was like, oh, 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 I don't like that. But then I get down the road and I go, oh, now that's better. But in the moment, it was like, ooh, <laughs> clipping, ugh. <laughs> but in the long run, it's better, right? Sometimes it's winter. Lying dormant. Seeming lifeless. Without purpose. Not giving fruit. Not growing. Wondering what's the purpose in this. But winter's necessary. Sometimes it's spring. New life. We don't like the seasons. We don't like them in our life. They're uncomfortable and they're hard. But it says, we'll bear fruit in his season. God is the one who decides the seasons of our life. We don't get to decide them. And, and when you find yourself in a place that's another season other than bearing fruit, it will be uncomfortable and it won't be fun. But, but think about it. If you know anything about how things grow, especially food, there has to be a dormant season. There has to be a prune season. There has to be a new life season 
then there gets to be a fruit-bearing season. They don't, you can't just bear fruit all the time, not until the millennial reign when there's the, the trees that bear fruit at 12 t- months out of the year. I just messed that up, but you all know what I mean. <laughs> but, but in this life, the way things go, they work in seasons, and, and sometimes the seasons are not comfortable. But, but the only way we get the fruit season is by going through the other ones. But, but in all seasons, it's important to remember what we're supposed to do in verse 2 and what we're not supposed to do in verse 1. And sometimes when you're going through winter seasons, sometimes when you're going through drought seasons, sometimes when you're going through pruning seasons, those are the ones where it's the most tempting to fall somewhere in verse, in verse 1. Because things are hard and, and not very fun. But, but he says, in his season, they will bring fruit. Then it says, and the leaf will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. We, the, the, the leaf not withering literally means to not fade or fall off. It's an evergreen. Even in the winter season, if we remain in Jesus, we're still evergreen. It might not feel that way, but we are. You know, one of the things that I love about living in the Northwest, Northwest is the evergreen. It is the fact that it doesn't matter whether it's winter, spring, summer, or fall. There's always a tons of trees that are just green all the time. Now, part of that, <clears throat> of course, is the tree type itself. The other part is the fact that we live in the Northwest and we get rain all the time. But I'm grateful for that because I love the evergreen. I love the fact that of the cedars and the pines and all those that are green year round. And it because every time I look at them, I think life still is going. It doesn't matter if it's winter, life is still going. Life is still moving through the cycles that God has perf- perfected for them to move through. And and even in winter, they're still green and there's still life. And so literally, the leaf will not wither even, it doesn't matter what season you're in. If you and I, we do what we're called to do, we will always have life, both for us and for other people. Life in, in, in the, the leaf not withering means that we're still giving off oxygen. We're still giving off the, the, the fragrance of Jesus. We're still giving off the life-giving ability that we have to, to give to other people. We still can provide shade for those who are weary and need a rest. We still can stand strong and have strength for those around us that might be weak and need a a, a stronger tree to protect them from the wind, even in the winter. But he says, your your leaf will not wither. And, you know, I'm going to be really honest with you. There's times when I felt like my leaves were withering. I was doing everything I was supposed to do, but I felt like a dried-up tree worse than a dried up tree. Like, have you ever been to the petrified forest? (laughs) But that's not the truth, you see, because God's word says so right here. Then it says he will prosper in whatever he does. And for you and I, this is very important. That prospering is determined by God and not by you and I. That prospering comes in so many manifold ways and in so many different um, places in our life. And it's God's determination of that prosper, not, not you and I. You know, when Pastor Mike took over the church uh, back in 05, um, we spent probably the first 10 years feeling like we were not prospering. Things were really hard. The church was really small. A lot of people had left. A lot of things had happened. And it was a struggle. And there were times when we were like, what are we doing wrong? (laughs) But the Lord just kept saying, you just need to be faithful. You just need to be faithful. You just need to be faithful. And and now look where we are. You know, the Lord has brought so many, so many people here. 
you know, people that, that needed a, a new church home, people that had never been to church, people that had been out of church, people that, that just were weary, and God is, is blessing them, and, and the church is, you know, thriving, in, and, and the people are doing well, and all of you come, and you get fed, and you get to go out, and you serve your families and, and whoever else you come in contact with because God was the one who chose the way that it would prosper and when it would prosper and what that looked like. You know, we, we had our idea, but God did, has his own idea and his own plan, you know. And so for you and I, that's, that's an important thing because we don't want to um, be in the mindset where we're trying to do the, the right thing. We're trying to be in the word and to walk in obedience and, and surrender to the Lord. And we're trying to allow him to change our lives the way he wants to and to be submitted to his will and serve where he wants us to serve and doing the things that, that, that we feel he's called us to do and we're doing it to the best of our ability. And, and yet it just seems like tidal waves keep coming and, and washing over you. Tidal waves keep coming and hitting you in the face and it doesn't seem that there's any fruit and it doesn't seem that there's any prospering. It just feels tiring and like you're rowing against a tsunami. But we just read that you'll bear fruit in his season and your ways will prosper. So don't lose heart and don't give up, but also don't try to be your own fruit inspector and fruit judge. Because you can't. And you know what? God does that because if you and I start being our own fruit inspectors, you know what we are? We are prideful, and we are self-righteous, and we are braggarts. Because then we got to go tell everybody about the great fruit that we have. Look at my fruit. Isn't it just so awesome? Yeah, I preached the gospel to like 10 people this week, and eight of them got saved. Isn't my fruit so awesome? I'm so much more humble now than I was before. Isn't my fruit so awesome? Let me just tell you about all the opportunities that God's given me to tell people about him. See, that's just like, right? But that's what happens if you become your own fruit inspector. And when you and I start to judge whether what our prosperity should be, we do the same thing. We start to become prideful or we start to become frustrated and we start to be accusatory towards the Lord. Well, I'm doing everything you've told me to do and I'm trying to be obedient. And look at, I just keep getting tidal waves and where's the prospering and where's the blessing because you said it would come. I know none of you would ever do that. But I'm just telling you what is a possibility. I have done that before. <laughs> so don't, don't be your own fruit inspector and your own decider of what is prosperous or not. Just be faithful to be obedient to the Lord and stand on the truth that he has said in Psalm 1 that you will bear fruit in your season and he will prosper you. And then you can say, Lord, I don't know what that looks like, and it doesn't matter. I just know you've promised it, so you're going to do it, and I'm just going to keep my head pointed at that cross and keep doing what you asked me to do, and you worry about the fruit, and you worry about the prosper, and you worry about whatever season it is, and I'm just going to do what you've called me to do. See, then when you start bearing fruit, you don't even know, but you don't care. Everybody else gets to have of your fruit. Everybody else gets to take from that tree that God is making you to be, and they get to partake in that. And God uses you in their life. He uses you to encourage or to instruct or whatever because the fruit of your life is there for everybody else. It's not for you. Our fruit isn't for us. Our fruit is for the Lord because, again, John chapter 15, this is the will of my Father that you go forth and bear much fruit. So it's the will of the Father that we bear fruit. So it's for him, and it's for everybody else around us. It's not for us. No apple tree eats its own apples. 
No, what happens is the apples that fall to the ground, maggots and bugs come and eat them and turn them into compost that goes into the soil. Then the tree sucks up the nutrients from the compost. I'll just leave you with that. So, again, Asa left off what he needed to do. And the Lord wants us to be reminded, do not leave off. Do not leave off your first works and your first fruits. And that is being in the word, following after the Lord, meditating day and night, and staying away from the walking, sitting, standing where we shouldn't be, right? Lord, we just thank you for your grace and thank you for your Holy Spirit that gives us the power and the ability to do what you've called us to do, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, helps us to <clears throat> make the right decisions and to go, to go down the right path. We still have a free will, Lord, but I thank you for the conviction and the direction and, and the courage and the strength that we are provided by the Holy Spirit. I thank you for your word, Lord, and how you've given us um, so much in it, your instruction, um, your correction, your reproof, your encouragement, your promises, and, and the revelation of who you are. I, we wouldn't know really who you are, Lord, without your word, and I just thank you for that. And I just pray for my sisters tonight, Lord. I, I pray that any of them that are feeling discouraged and uh, or overwhelmed with the tsunamis of life or feeling that they're in a winter season and not bearing fruit or feeling that they're even withering, Lord, and, and that everything is just falling apart instead of prospering. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray, Lord, that they would come to you and that they would renew, Lord, just their commitment to be steadfastly following after you and let you worry about the fruit and the prosper and let you worry about the seasons and where they come and where they go. I pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them. I pray that you would hold them, Lord, ever so tight. And, Father, I pray that each one of us would finish our race well, that we would not turn aside to the left or to the right. I pray if there's people or things in our lives, Lord, that we need to move away from just because they're not fruitful, Lord, um, I pray that you would help us to be willing to do that. I thank you again for your grace. I thank you for your word. And, Lord, we look forward to seeing you. We pray that you would come get us soon, Jesus. We're, we're all so ready to see you face to face. And so we just say, nevertheless, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Maranatha. Amen.